my name is Michael Sutherland. I'm the admissions tutor here at Corpus Christi College. Um, my background is uh, in physics, so I also direct studies here in physical natural sciences. So this um, uh, session is going to be on preparing for a Cambridge interview. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what a Cambridge interview is, what it consists of, the sorts of things that you should um, do to prepare for an interview, and how we use the interview in the selection process. So perhaps it's, um, it's good just to begin by taking maybe a step back um, and uh, just to kind of recap some of the things we've been talking about all day, um, looking at uh, what it is that we are hoping to find in our successful ap applicants. So what is it that a Cambridge admissions tutor or director of studies looks for? Well, we're assessing our applicants on the basis of their academic ability and academic potential. Uh, so we're looking for evidence of things like logical thought, independent thought. So do people have their own ideas um, or are they just simply very good at kind of regurgitating the material that they learned at, at GCSE? We, we really value that kind of critical thinking uh, and independence of, of thought. We're looking for evidence of motivation and suitability for the chosen course. So um, you may have uh, seen in my session, the first thing this morning, we talked about um, the importance of wider reading um, and exploring the subject and kind of understanding you know, what you're getting into before you commit to a three or four year degree. And I think Will gave a very nice talk um, with some great suggestions for resources that you might use over the summer um, to, to build up your, your motivation uh, and understanding of, of the subject in advance of an application. And uh, we're also looking for evidence of commitment and organization. So we want people who are um, you know, organized and have a certain amount of self-discipline. Um, that's really quite important um, to succeed in university and particularly in Cambridge where much of the learning is self-directed. So you, you spend quite a bit of your time, particularly in arts and humanities subjects, working on your own. Um, so reading books by yourself in the library, working on essays ahead of the supervision. So you've, you've got to have that kind of motivation uh, in order to succeed in our, uh, in, in, our, in our system. And then finally, for a few courses, and I'm thinking um, in particularly, uh, particularly here medicine, um, we would be looking for vocational or professional commitment. Um, so it's uh, very, very useful for you if you're thinking of applying um, for medicine to try to get some opportunities, shadowing a GP, volunteering in a care home, um, getting uh, an idea of what it's like to be a doctor in a clinical setting. Um, but for other, other subjects, um, that's, that's less uh, important. So those are the sorts of attributes that we're looking for in successful applicants. And, and how do we assess whether an applicant um, has these things? Well, um, one thing I want to emphasize when we're making our admissions decisions, we're doing it in what we call a holistic way. Uh, and so by that, I mean, we're looking at all of the available information that we have um, before we make a decision. And we're trying to really understand the applicant as, as a as a person, we want to understand their strengths, their weaknesses, their, um, their, their potential for success here. And so the sorts of information that we have when we make our decision, well, we have um, your academic records. So we, we know what you've achieved um, in your um, GCSEs or, or equivalents if you're from another school system. Um, we have your personal statement and Naomi's just given a really great talk uh, about the sorts of things you could put in there. Uh, we have a school or college reference. So this is um, information from your teachers and from your school about your academic progress and, and their view on, on your potential for, for success. Um, for some subjects um, in arts and humanities subjects, uh, obviously um, in particular, we, we would ask you to submit um, uh, written work, essays that were written as part of your, of your A-levels. Uh, so we can get a sense of your writing style, um, you know, how you write, how you structure an argument. Um, some courses will have a, a written assessment or test, um, some of these take place in advance of, of the interview, um, so typically in, in October or, or November. Uh, and some of these take place at the interview. So you would write them uh, the day of, of your interview or perhaps the week of your, uh, of, of, of your interview. And we look at your scores in these. Uh, and then we look at contextual data. So by that, I mean, we have information about your school. Um, we know what an average applicant from your school achieves in terms of their A-levels and GCSEs. Uh, and so we can look at your achievements and place that in the context of your peers. And we're really hoping to get um, you know, some of the best students 
uh, from your school. And I can perhaps illustrate that with an example. So um, if we think of, of GCSEs, um, if we had a student who achieved um, say five eights or nines um, and uh, the average student from that school achieved you know, maybe seven eights or nines and that achievement you know, in the context of the other students perhaps wouldn't be um, so impressive. However, if a student achieved five eights or nines and they were the first person in their school to do that, that would be absolutely amazing. It would be an outstanding achievement in the context of that educational background. So um, that's something we can take into account um, when we make our admissions um, decisions. And then finally, we look at your performance um, in the interviews if you are called to interview. And it's rarely, um, uh, you know, the same size fits all decision. Uh, every candidate has their strengths and weaknesses and a typical admissions emission, decision might go something like, um, you know, their GCSEs were perhaps a little bit on the weaker side, but their teachers are predicting wonderful things at, at A level. Personal statement was maybe a little bit weird. Um, one interview went really well, one interview so-so, um, but they really did well on the, on the admissions assessment. So looking at all those strengths and weaknesses, let's make that person um, a decision. And each and every decision that we make is made in that, in that kind of, of way. So it's possible to be you know, slightly weaker in some elements of your application, but still be a competitive applicant. And the point of all this is just to reassure you that while the interview is important and it's something that we look at, it is not the key thing, the final hurdle that you need to overcome to get a place at Cambridge. So you might ask, well, why is it that we interview in the first place? Uh, well, we're very fortunate at this university to receive um, many applications and, and many of these students look outstanding on paper and that they will have strong GCSEs and good predicted grades and be doing wonderful things um, in their personal statement. And this is, a, this kind of allows us to capture additional information that maybe is not captured uh, in the paper record, in that UCAS application. So people who look very similar on paper um, can often be very different um, in person. Um, we want to learn a little bit about aptitudes and interests. We've talked, I think, quite a bit about this today. We want to make sure that um, an applicant's interests are well matched um, to the course that they're applying to. We want to um, assess the potential of that applicant, the academic potential, to study their chosen subject at a, at a high level um, and to demonstrate to us that they develop the appropriate skills. So if they're looking to apply for um, a language course, for instance, uh, MML or medieval and modern languages, do they have that technical proficiency in French or German or whatever language they want to study? Uh, and can they demonstrate a mastery of those skills? Um, because that's a foundation that will take them forward um, as they go on in Cambridge. We're looking for evidence that an applicant can think independently, flexibly, and critically. Uh, and also to take on board new information. So often in these interviews, um, there'll be a great sort of back and forth discussion between the applicants uh, and the interviewers, uh, with the interviewers providing them new information or new ways of looking at things. And we're kind of seeing how students think and how they take on board that, that information uh, and move forward with it. Basically, these interviews are modeled very closely on the way that we teach in Cambridge. Much of the teaching happens in Cambridge in small group supervision sessions. So although we do have lectures, just like any other university, I think one of the really unique aspects of our educational system is that we do um, several one hour um, sessions per week of small group teaching. And that could be one, two or three students with um, an instructor. Uh, and these interviews are, are really kind of like mini supervisions. And we're seeing whether a student is comfortable uh, and uh, would uh, excel in that particular learning environment. So what sorts of things should you expect um, in an admissions interview? And you read all kinds of things on the, on the internet. So if you, if you Google Oxbridge admissions interview, you get all kinds of um, companies that, are, um, that say that they have the secrets, um, they can sell them to you for a, a, a huge price. Um, all of that, of course, is, is nonsense. Um, there's no real secret behind um, the Oxford or Cambridge admissions interviews. Um, they're very much, as I said, academic based and, and um, looking to test that suitability for, um, for small group teaching. So um, in terms of the format of the interviews, um, uh, most applicants would receive two interviews. Sometimes it's one, occasionally um, it's three. And that's set by the course um, and the availability of interviewers at a particular college. Um, typically, these interviews run between 20 to 30 minutes um, in lengths. Uh, occasionally, if you only receive, say, one interview, 
Um, that would be a slightly longer interview, a 45 minutes uh, interview, say. Uh, but all of that information will be communicated to you well in advance um, of you coming up to interview. Typically, we tend to call students up to interview um, usually in, in November. So October 15th would be the deadline for submission of your UCAS form. Uh, and this gives us a couple of weeks to think about um, all of the applications, read all those personal statements, uh, and then uh, make decisions about who comes to interview, usually in, in November. And we try to give students at least two to three weeks uh, advance notice. Um, often the interviews are held uh, in December um, and sometimes they creep into early November, but, but the vast majority of interviews are, are held um, in December. Um, this year it was just announced that again, um, the Cambridge interviews will be held virtually um, online using a platform um, like uh, Zoom. Um, and the reason for this is, uh, well, we don't exactly know what's going to happen with, with the pandemic. We have all of our fingers and toes crossed that we'll be able to teach in person again um, next year, but of course that can't be guaranteed. So we're going to plan, I think, for one more round to do these interviews um, virtually. So what kinds of things come up um, in an admissions uh, interview? So as you heard from um, the last presentation, Naomi um, mentioned the importance of uh, talking about your interests in your personal statement. Uh, and we do indeed reach, read each and every one of these personal statements. So um, quite often you'll get a discussion that are based, that's based on the academic interest mentioned in your personal statement. So it could be about a particular book that you've read, um, a particular set of mathematics problems that you've solved that you're really proud of. Um, those kinds of things are often a great way to start uh, an admissions uh, interview. Sometimes you get challenging questions related to A-level courses. So um, because the interviews will take place for most students at the beginning of year 13, they would have had that year 12 um, information uh, in their heads, hopefully. Uh, and so we're going to test a little bit about how well you understand some of the concepts you, you've been um, exposed to. Um, so these are, you know, could be technical things like conjugating verbs or uh, differentiating a mathematical function. Uh, but we want to make sure that you understand um, what you've been taught so far in your courses uh, and have mastered it to the point where, where you can apply it sometimes to new situations. So application of existing knowledge to, to new situations is, is, is a very common um, theme uh, in our interviews. In the sciences, um, and I'm thinking particularly here of um, the physical natural sciences, engineering, mathematics, computer science, these interviews are almost entirely working through problems. Um, so they're very much problem uh, based. Sometimes you get um, uh, a brief discussion of something from your personal statement. Uh, myself, when I'm interviewing for physical natural sciences, I would say in a 25 minute interview, I would normally spend two to three minutes on the personal statement and the rest solving uh, mathematics, um, physics and chemistry problems. So keep in mind, um, those of you applying for science courses, it's going to be about solving problems um, on, a, on a piece of paper or a, a virtual equivalent to that. In art subjects, um, uh, obviously less problem based, um, very often um, in, in an arts uh, or humanities uh, interview, you're given um, a piece of text to, to read in advance. This could be, say, a, a poem um, if you're applying for English. This could be a short essay if you're applying for something like, like history. This could be um, maybe an article from um, uh, some uh, economics journal if you're applying for, for economics. But basically, it's something that no, no applicant will have seen before. Um, uh, and you're given this usually you know, five, 10, 15 minutes in advance, you read it through and you come into that interview um, ready to discuss what, what you've just read. And here we're testing whether you can um, understand what you've read and, and we're testing again, this important aspect of, of critical and independent thinking. Can you read this essay that was, um, that was written form your own opinion? You know, I agree with the author, I disagree with the author on the following points and back that up um, with evidence. So that's um, very common in, in some arts and humanities interviews, uh, a, a pre-reading or text to, to discuss. Um, sometimes in science interviews, you get a specimen. Um, so this could be, um, say, a slide of some wiggly nematode or something if you're applying for biological natural sciences. Uh, and the interviewer, interviewers might take you through a series of questions on that. 
Uh, and coming back to arts and humanities courses, I mentioned um, some courses would ask you to submit um, examples of your written work that you've done as part of your A-levels in advance. Uh, and sometimes interviewers will um, have some questions about that. So I see, you know, you've submitted this essay that talks about, um, you know, the historical context of, uh, of World War I. Um, you know, let's have a little discussion about um, your arguments in your, in your essay. So in addition to reading these personal statements, um, we actually do read these submitted essays as, uh, as well. So those are kind of common things um, that uh, tend to come up um, in admissions interviews. Um, I wanna give you some uh, idea of sample questions. Um, and these are two examples of real admissions interview questions that have been used in the past. And something that you'll see with both of these questions, and we'll go through them in a moment, they're kind of open-ended. Um, there are not necessarily right or wrong answers. Um, perhaps for the physics one, there, there's some, some more right um, uh, answers. Um, but the point is, it's, uh, it's an interesting problem that you can pose to students uh, and you can give them tips and advice um, and get them to think through it. So beginning with the history one, the question is, imagine we had no record at all about the past, except everything to do with sports. How much of the past could we find out about? And so you might start to think here, well, um, you know, it, it's, all, it's all written from the point of view maybe of, of the athletes. And, and so perhaps we can get, we can start touching upon the idea of, um, that, you know, the, the importance of, of voice in, in historical accounts and documents. And then you might start to think, well, you know, what about the people who are organizing, um, you know, the early Olympics, say? Um, and there's clearly they were getting some funding from somewhere and maybe they had some wealthy patrons. And so you could learn a little bit about the economics of, it, of that period. Um, maybe if you, if you knew about the history of the Olympic Games and, and, and maybe um, issues of race and apartheid could have come up uh, in there. And so you might start to think about some of the wider social um, context of that. So you can see there's springboards, there's lots of different directions you can go off um, in, in this. And I think a good answer um, would perhaps touch on some of these factors, but be able to use examples from your own reading, other things maybe you've studied as part of your history A level, or things you've, you've come across when you've been doing your, your wider reading. Um, so it's a really quite broad question, but an interviewer would, would be kind of prompting you to think and giving you things to think about um, and help you understand the different angles of, of, the, of this question. Moving on to the sciences example. Uh, so this is a question I used six or seven years ago. I won't use it again, obviously. Um, but the question I posed to, to applicants was, um, something I, I read, I read a quote about a Texas senator, um, and Texas senators are, um, you know, by and large climate change skeptics. And this senator said, well, you know, the sea levels are rising um, because more people are going for a swim because um, the population is, is very large on, on, on the earth. So this is, of course, nonsense, but um, a good physicist might be able to come up with a kind of back of the envelope calculation to show that this is uh, not true. So the question is, if everyone in the world went for a swim, them at the same time, how much would the sea levels rise? So I wouldn't expect anybody to know the answer. Um, but what I was interested in, in learning about here is how a student would approach that, that problem. So you might think, okay, well, um, the earth is a sphere and you'd have some guess about the radius of that. And you'd have some guess about how much of the sphere is covered in water. Uh, and then you might think back to Archimedes principle, which you've um, hopefully come across the idea that, you know, somebody submerged in water is going to displace um, a, a certain volume. Uh, and you could come up with an estimate of the population for the Earth, and you could combine all these numbers together. Um, and if you couldn't remember one or didn't have a sensible guess, I, I just give that to you. Uh, and you can hopefully work your way through um, to some kind of order of magnitude estimate. Uh, and for those of you who are keen to run off and do this on a piece of paper, I get um, that the sea level would rise about uh, one times 10 to the minus six meters, one micron. Um, less than the thickness of a human hair. Um, so we can go back to that Texas senator and say, um, you know, it's not people swimming uh, in the ocean that's causing sea levels to rise. Uh, but those are two examples of, of interview questions. So what are some of the things that you can do to prepare um, in advance for um, an interview? Um, so first, I think it's really good to um, make sure you understand all the logistics of what's going to happen on the day. If they're in-person interviews, um, you know, you want to make sure that you knew what room they were in um, and what time you had to be there. Um, if 
their online interviews like we'll have this year. You'll want to be familiar with the platform and any technical requirements. Um, and you should make sure you, you get that sorted well in, in advance and you can always contact the admissions office of the college you're applying to to get clarification. But what you don't want to do is sort of 10 minutes before the interview um, have to you know, download Zoom and try to figure out how to use it. That will just cause you to be stressed on the day. So make sure you get your technical and practical arrangements sorted well in advance of the interview. Um, have a, a review of recent academic work. So um, revise your notes from, um, from the previous year, from, from year 12. Some of that content might, might come up. Um, this was mentioned in one of the previous talks today, uh, but for some subjects, and I'm thinking things like you know, politics, law, and, and economics, um, you can occasionally get questions that are related to um, you know, topical ideas in those subjects. So you might get, um, I don't know, a, a few years ago, you might have got a question about um, the economic impact of Brexit. You know, is it going to be a positive or negative thing? What are your views on that? Um, you know, and there we're, we're kind of looking whether students are um, engaged with what's going on in the real world um, in their uh, subject. Um, less common, I would say, for subjects like um, you know, physics, uh, where we're uh, much more interested in sort of problem solving. But, but you can occasionally get that sort of thing in, in a subject like law. So you know, do read the newspaper, um, ha have a look at what's um, you know, topical in your, in your subject. Um, Reread your personal statement. Um, sounds trivial, but um, again, you know, it's, it, it is, um, uh, I wouldn't say likely, but um, there is a, a fairly reasonable chance that you would get question coming from your personal statement. So go back, reread your personal statement, familiarize yourself with what's in there. Um, perhaps just go back and look at your notes from a particular novel or, or whatever that you put in your personal statement. Uh, just come prepared to, the, to, to discuss um, anything you put in your personal statement uh, with, with somebody who, who might actually be a, an expert in the field. Um, practice critical thinking and know the difference between opinion and arguments based on facts. So um, this is something I think sometimes students fall into this trap um, in, it, uh, in an admissions interview and, and they're asked um, to give their views on a particular um, uh, topic or assertion um, and they immediately respond with their opinion. You know, I think that the death penalty is wrong, um, but you know, that's just an opinion. How can you how can you um, back up that opinion with, with facts? You know, I think that the death penalty is wrong um, because I've, I've read that um, the number of people um, convicted in the US uh, and sentenced to death who actually later on go on to be proven innocent um, is, is significant. And therefore I think there's too much of a risk um, of, of, a, of a false, um, uh, false justice there. So um, make sure you can try to back up any assertions um, in an admissions interview uh, with something that you've read, something that you've come across, um, any kind of fact, uh, rather than just based on, strictly on opinion. Um, another thing you might want to do in advance of an interview is just have a look at who your interviewers um, will be. Um, don't um, cyber stalk them because that's a bit weird, but um, it would be useful, you know, if you um, perhaps were having an interview for natural sciences here, at um, Corpus, you could just have a look at who your interviewers would be, just to kind of settle your nerves a little bit. So you know these aren't complete strangers um, when they pop up on the Zoom screen. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to you know look in detail at all the papers they publish and that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's that's not relevant for you. But it's more just to get a sense of who the interviewers will be, so it's it's not a, a surprise um, on the day. So that's what you can do well in advance of, of interviews. Um, Sharpening your problem solving skills. So this is just uh, aimed at those students who are applying for problem solving based subjects, um, things like um, physical natural sciences, engineering, etc. cetera. Um, as I mentioned, probably about 90 to 95% of those interviews will be problem based. Um, and there are great resources available. We'll touch on some of these um, that give you a chance to practice interview like questions um, and get good at, at doing them. So, um, there's the Isaac Physics website that we'll mention. I want to study engineering, um, obviously aimed at engineers. Um, computer science, um, they've got this climb webpage that has some um, interesting problems on it. Mathematics, um, they have past um, step papers. Um, so particularly thinking of step one, which is uh, no longer um, used, but 
would have been um, covering year 12 material. And that, that's a good way to practice your mathematics skills. And most of these will have um, solutions available um, as well. So, so you, you can test um, yourself. Um, do go into those um, technical interviews um, for any of these subjects, um, having done a good bit of um, problem solving practice. So on the day, um, what sorts of things should you keep in mind? Um, so I think, you know, my top piece of advice, my number one tip, um, listen carefully to what is being asked because um, sometimes students get a bit nervous in, in, in the interview um, and they, um, uh, they, they just kind of blurt out an answer to a question that they perhaps have prepared or, or thought about in advance, uh, but that wasn't what the interviewer um, was, was asking. Um, so make sure that you're addressing directly the question that, that's asked. And if you don't understand the question, um, by all means, ask for a clarification. You know, I didn't quite understand what you said there. Did you mean I should take the derivative or integrate this function? You know, make sure you're clear on the instructions before you give um, an answer. Um, try to answer with clarity and focus. So I know sometimes when people get a bit nervous, they tend to ramble and they go on and on. They just try and cram everything that they possibly know about the subject into their answer. But it's absolutely fine just to take a pause, kind of reflect for 10 or 15 seconds and, and give an answer that's, that's very clear and direct and focused on the question um, that you're being asked. Um, always be willing to explain your, your thinking. Um, so, you know, very commonly an interviewer might say, interesting you said that, you know, why? What, what, what leads you to that particular thought? So, um, you know, it's useful um, to practice this perhaps in, in, um, in advance. So thinking of, of a particular um, topic, you know, why might you reach a certain um, conclusion? Um, what, what sort of path led you um, to, to say that, that statement? Uh, and be willing to adjust your reasoning in light of, of new evidence. So sometimes you'll come up with a particular assertion. Um, you'll, you'll say it's backed up by this evidence, but the interviewer will say, oh, well, you know, have you considered this? Here, um, I'm going to show you some data that shows um, a particular feature. Uh, maybe you want to revise uh, what you've just said. Uh, and so, you know, you, you can think about your assertion, look at this new evidence, uh, and, you know, maybe you need to um, go back and, and rethink your original um, assertion. So be, be flexible um, in your thought. But always keep in mind what matters in these interviews is content and not style. Um, so some people are worried, you know, if I'm a bit shy um, on, the, on the day, um, um, you know, perhaps I'm not so great at, at chit chat, is this going to affect my opportunities um, with uh, an interview? And the answer there is, is, is no, um, you know, we're not interested in, in, in how you say it, uh, we're interested in what you say. So we're very much listening to the words that are coming out uh, and thinking about each and every one of those and not so interested in how you're saying them. You can be incredibly confident and verbose and eloquent. And if you're saying complete rubbish, it's complete rubbish. We'd much rather have that kind of shyer um, student who perhaps is a little bit uncomfortable, but who says some particularly original or brilliant thing. That's what we're looking for um, in, in the interview. So um, I'm just going to switch over now. Um, uh, we're going to watch a few minutes um, of an admissions interview video. And I'll just give you um, a bit of commentary. I think we'll watch about six or seven minutes of it, uh, and then we'll switch over to, to questions. Um, there are some really great videos available online, mock interviews in um, almost all of the subjects. Um, I, my advice to you is always um, look at the source of these. So um, I would tend to trust the ones that come from either the university or the individual department, or perhaps one of the colleges, because this is going to give you, um, you know, the real perspective of, of what happens um, in, uh, uh, one of our interviews from the people who actually do the interviews uh, and kind of ignore all those ones that are produced by, uh, by for-profit companies. Um, some students put up things reflecting on their interviews. Some of these are, are reasonably good, but sometimes students get the questions a bit muddled or, or forget you know, what it was they were asked. Um, so perhaps those are not so reliable. I would always trust those that are coming from uh, you know, one of these uh, university department or colleges. So uh, very briefly, we're gonna watch a couple um, minutes of. Uh, this video and um, I've chosen here um, a subject which is one of our smaller subjects. Um, this is linguistics uh, and um, probably most of you won't have um, you know, studied much about ling linguistics. It's, it's the scientific study of language. Uh, this is a mock interview done um, 
with a, a student from Churchill. Uh, and we'll go through and we'll have a look at just the style of, of, of the interview, the types of questions that come up and how the students um, interacts. So hopefully this should work okay. Full screen there. And then if I play, that should hopefully work for you. So, Dean, welcome. It's very nice that you can come to join us. Um, so let me just introduce us first of all. So I'm Teresa Bivera, the Director of Study and Linguistics here, and this is my colleague, uh, Annie King. All right. So what we're going to do is this interview is going to be 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And what we'll do at the start is just focus on a point or two from your personal statement. But most of this interview is actually going to focus on a range of uh, linguistically based challenges. We'll clarify as we go along. And the idea with all of our questions is not to sort of try to pose mysterious questions where you're wondering what on earth was that aimed at. So if anything seems not entirely clear, do please feel that you can ask for clarifications at any point, because we may unintentionally be unclear. Okay. Yeah, I think the, it, just to, you know, um, uh, follow on what Teresa has said, is the way you think is your thought processes that we are interested in. Okay. Yeah, so that's very common. Um, usually interviewers will introduce themselves and just talk a little bit about the format of the interview, just to kind of put you um, at ease at the beginning. Okay, so let's just start with your personal statement, for which thank you very much. It's really rich and just um, wonderful to see the kinds of linguistic things you're filling your time with. So I noted, because it's impossible not to notice, how many languages you've dealt with, and not just French and Spanish, which you're clearly doing at school, but also that you've done work on a range of Slavic languages, so Russian and Polish, that you have familiarity with German, you say you dabble in <laughs> Dutch and so on. So I think a question that I really be very interested to hear a little bit on is, having looked at so many different types of languages, if you had to identify a really striking difference between the languages you've looked at, what, what has kind of struck you as the most surprising linguistic property you found in any of these languages you've looked at? Looked at? So that's on the one hand. And then the other, what's actually surprisingly quite similar across these superficially quite distinct languages? Hmm. I guess you never really think about that when you do all these languages, you kind of you look at them individually and you can acquire them individually, but comparing them is a whole different aspect, I think. Um, if I really had to think about what would be, I guess, striking about, about some of these languages, I guess it would be probably some of the inflection. Um, so in Hungarian, for example, you do have evidence of some sort of polypersonal things going on, but that's just one sort of suffix. When you say polypersonal, you mean? So, um, you can have both the subject and object encoded into the verb. So, for example, you have the suffix lag or lark, depending on the vowel harmony. And that means a first person doing something to a second person. So, um, knees, for example, I am to look. If you add lag, knees lag, that becomes I look at you. Um, but that's the only evidence uh, of polypersonal, like, conjugation in Hungarian. Like, it doesn't work extensively, like in maybe, maybe other languages. Um, but I find it really, you know, striking that there is one specific thing for one, like, first person and second person. And similarly, I think this... So he's been asked a question about similarities and differences in these various languages that's put in his personal statement. And, you know, this is something that I think quite naturally would arise. You want to see if a student um, who puts these things in the personal statement has actually studied them and maybe thought about them. Um, I think this question is thrown him. Um, looking at him, he seemed a little bit surprised by it. Um, and his technique here is to go back to something that he, he knows is a bit unusual. So he's talked about um, Hungarian uh, and this particular aspect of, of Hungarian that, that is unusual. Um, and he's, he's you know, I wasn't able to address the question originally, but he's, he's gone back to something that he knows and he's kind of thinking his way through um, the question. So let's see if he if he improves um, as we go on. Suffix comes from like a frequentative suffix. Oh, that's an unusual. I know, so I don't know why. <laughs> like it's the frequentative suffix. Um, I think I don't think it's productive anymore. I think, but you have the frequentative suffix plus another suffix, which is just first person, and somehow that birthed this polypersonal thing. So. Um, so that's the most peculiar thing you've discussed yeah, so think, far. With Hungarian, I would say. Um, 
but with Russian, with Russian, mm, I would say just the stress changes. The stress changes in Russian are very special. <laughs> um, <laughs> they really get to me, um, and I have a lot of trouble with them. But when you compare them with Proto Slavic, and you know the prosody that you find in Proto Slavic, I think it's kind of I don't know, I'm still unsure about how like all this stress change like came about. And, um, so I think I think that's something to look into. What about the tenses in Russian? The tenses. I mean, so in Russian, you can, like most Slavic languages, you have three tenses. You have the past, the present, and the future. The future isn't usually synthetic. Um, but um, there are also two lexical aspects. Um, so last aspect is encoded into the verbs. So you have separate words, I guess, for like to say. So you'd have um, using Polish, for example, mówić, which would be imperfective. Um, so that denotes some sort of incomplete action, um, and its counterpart would be like its perfective counterpart would be um, powiedzieć. So they have <coughs> complete aspect. They're complete, like completely different words, like lexically. But they refer to the same action, and um, I think he's done quite well there. Actually, he's um, been given some. Uh, you're obviously now probing uh, his knowledge of, of Russian, which he put in his personal statement, uh, and you know I think he's shown pretty good knowledge about um, the verb tenses there. Uh, but he's been very honest about um, you know he's not bluffing. He's saying I find these things very difficult. Um, you know these, the stresses are are incredibly um, challenging for me, um, and I think you know. That sort of honesty with with the interviewers, you know, being um, forthright about your own limitations, um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and you know, I, I think that's a good aspect of, of his answer. That's which is the same in Russian, yeah, exactly. And they all combine differently to um, create, you know, our tenses, and they map differently as well. Um, so what we meant, for example, I think I can think of a perfect example in English. Like, have you eaten today? Mm. Um, so in, in English, that's perfect. We focus on the perfect part of it, like the completion. But in Polish, you would say, so imperfective. Um, so that's also like a fun like comparison thing, because it's like it's not a direct mapping um, onto what you might think is. You know, so that's that's a sort of quite a quite a big difference. But if you had to yeah. highlight the most striking similarity between the language. Striking similarity. Oh. I mean, I can't really speak much for languages outside of like Europe. Um, like a lot of the languages I have looked at are Indo-European or just within the European like space, like you know, Hungarian that's not Indo-European, but you know, you're like this. Um, but a lot of I, again, it's usually just inflection, similar um, I guess conjugations and stuff. Um, yeah, in fact looking at Hungarian, um, you can find that its conjugation is similar to like European ones, even Indo-European ones, even though it's not it's really exactly like related. So yeah, it's kind of right. I think we'll leave that and we'll move on to challenges. So we have some sheets for you. You start. Am I starting? Yes, it's quite right. I'm starting and I'm not handing you a sheet first. So what we're going to do first of all is um, the important thing here is I'm going to give you one word at a time. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is that you don't think about the spelling of this word. Right. The key thing is to focus on the sounds. And all I want you to do is to tell me what are the consonant vowel sequences in okay. that word. Sure. So for example, if I give you something like brick, then you should say consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant. Okay. okay. Sure. So let's start with phrase. Phrase. Consonant, consonant. Are we treating like I think you call them diphthongs? Diphthongs, diphthongs yeah. Very good. You, I think are we treating them as two vowels or one vowel? Well, you can treat them for the purpose of this. I think we can say one, but good okay. point that okay. there is a diphthong. Okay. Yeah. Uh, vowel, consonant. Consonant, yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, right. So you can see that the interview has now shifted. So they've moved on from his personal statements, uh, and they have a set of prepared exercises for him. Um, and you can see they've, they've asked him um, this particular question uh, and he asked for clarification. Um, so he said, you know, uh, this issue of, of diphthongs, um, could you clarify that for me, please? 
So, you know, that was a, a really good, rather than kind of sitting there and kind of panicking and saying, I'm not sure what to do, he asked the interviewers for, for clarification. Uh, and, and you could get a sense of his thinking, you get a sense of, of his thought processes um, as he went. So um, you can watch, of course, the, the rest of this. This is um, available online. Um, as I said, this is, I think, Churchill College. Um, but I hope you, you got an idea from there of the fact that these interviews are, are very much a, a conversation. And it's a kind of back and forth with the interviewers providing some information, kind of you know, gently um, pressing the, the applicants, uh, listening to what they're saying, and then feeding back as you go. So I think that was a pretty good example of, of what would be um, you know, a, a pretty a kind of a normal or average um, Cambridge interview. So I'm going to end my bit of the presentation there. And uh, I hope we've got quite a few questions. I can see um, quite a bunch have come in. So Naomi, I'll turn it over to you. Maybe you could pose some of these questions to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think what I'll do is start with some of the sort of more interview specific questions to stick with this workshop. We've also had quite a number of questions that are more general admissions questions come in. So um, just because of time, I think we might save those for 3.30. So if you've asked a, an admissions question, please do come back at 3.30 and we can address them then. And same goes for any questions that we don't manage to get through now. Um, but first of all, I'm going to ask, quite a few people have been asking about um, sort of the online interviews. And so specifically, will the on online interviews impact admissions decisions in any way, do you think? Well, no, because everybody will be doing the same uh, online interviews. Um, so the, the decision has been made that, um, you know, across all of the colleges, we'd be doing our, our interviews online. So uh, it will impact everyone, but it will impact everyone in the same way. Great, thank you. And I'm not going to go through kind of every single subject and what will this subject have in interview, but just to pick out a couple where we've had a lot of people ask. So um, a lot of people have been asking about medicine interviews. And um, so um, what should we, you know, should, what should be expected in a, in a medicine interview? Is it scientific or is it kind of medical case study? And will the BMAT essay be referred to at all? Yeah, very, very good question. So one thing to be aware of at Cambridge, um, the medicine course is essentially an applied science course for the first three years. So you really got to demonstrate um, a good knowledge of, of scientific content of your, of your A-levels, um, particularly uh, chemistry, which is, which is important for us. Um, having said that, most people will be seen by a clinician, so that's a practicing um, doctor, uh, and he or she might ask you questions related to um, clinical practice. So um, questions about ethics, questions about um, you know, strengths and weaknesses of the NHS. So it's very good if you thought a little bit about you know, what it means to be a doctor um, in um, the UK. Uh, but, you know, make sure you have a good solid foundation in your sciences because much of the content will, will be scientific. Thank you. Um, and then on the BMAT essay, do you think that would be referred right. to? So um, interviewers could ask questions from um, the BMAT essay. Um, in my experience, certainly at Corpus, we, we, we never do. We have enough stuff to ask that we don't, um, we don't refer back to those. But I can't speak for every college. Perhaps some colleges would. Thank you. And then the other subject that um, a lot of people have been asking about is economics. And should that should um, candidates expect that to be mathematically based or is that sort of broader? Yeah, again, it's, it's a mixture of both. Um, so um, economics is, um, as we saw before, you know, very heavily based on, on mathematics. Um, so you might expect to have um, some mathematics questions that come up. Um, but also, you know, there are elements of the economics course um, that involve thinking about, um, you know, history. Um, and so, you know, we would want students to be able to argue more generally and, and you know, have good essay writing skills and, and that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of a humanities element to these economics um, interviews, but, but I'd say the majority of them would tend to be mathematics um, based. Thank you. Um, somebody's asked about the overseas interview scheme and whether that sort of is in any way different to a normal interview, particularly maybe because we're all virtual now. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. So um, there will be some documentation going up shortly about the overseas interview scheme. Um, in past years, of course, a number of us would fly out to um, locations where we got lots of applicants, which would allow somebody to be interviewed in, in their home city or home country, um, which saves a long haul flight, which is good. Um, with everything being online this year, we're still going to run um, uh, overseas interviews. Um, and the poor um, interviewers, and, and I'm one of them, will be syncing themselves up with your local time. So, um, you know, if you live uh, in, in Singapore or, or China, where you might be seven, eight, nine hours ahead of us, um, you know, we'll all be getting up at three in the morning um, so that you can be interviewed um, during the normal working day. 
Um, so yes, there'll be more information on that, but the overseas interview scheme will, will still be uh, running, albeit virtually. Thank you. Um, what about asking questions at the end of an interview? So interviews often end with an opportunity to ask any questions. I think people get quite worried about what, what they should say at that point. Should you ask a question and what sort of thing should it be? I mean, there's, there's, no, um, there's no need to, to ask a, a question. Often we just give it to candidates um, as an opportunity in case there's anything they're unclear about. Um, but hopefully through sessions you know, like we're doing today, they've, they've pretty much got all of their questions um, answered. So don't feel like you need to go in and you know, come up with a, with a clever question um, at the end. Just use it as an opportunity to ask something that you're unclear about. Thank you. Um, what about if you think the interview is going really badly? Do you have any advice for somebody who's just considered see it rolling away from them a bit? Yeah, um, it's probably going much better than you think. Um, and uh, what happens in, in, in these interviews is, is often there's, there's a bit of a gradient. So you start with something, um, you know, maybe a little bit easier. Um, so in that video we just watched, the first exercise was perhaps a bit easy, but if you watch it to the end, they do some really complicated things. Uh, and so often a student going through that will suddenly feel that they're a little bit out of their depth. Um, but that means that they've actually progressed onto some quite advanced um, material. Uh, so, you know, your perception of how the interviewer is going um, is not necessarily the same as the interviewer's um, uh, perception. So often when I see my students again and they, you know, they come and they matriculate, they join us in October, they say, I thought I didn't get in. I thought I bombed the interview. And I'll say, well, no, you, you get kind of nine out of 10. That was the best interview of the day. So um, yeah, keep in mind, um, your perceptions are probably different than, than the interviewers. Thank you. Um, a few people have asked about sort of what you can take into the interview. So can you take notes into the interview and also maybe in the, in the maths and physical and natural sciences, can you take a calculator in? Uh, I mean, that would be up to the college, but, um, but I would say um, most colleges would, would, would say no, because we're not interested in sort of factual recall from, from your notes, we're interested in, in your thinking process. And if you're just reading from notes, um, you're not demonstrating to us you know, how your brain works. Thank you. Um, if you're applying for physical natural sciences, so you probably made it clear in your personal statement which science you're most interested in, as we, we mentioned earlier today, but could you then be asked questions more broadly about all the sciences? Yeah, I think if, if you've, um, if you're applying to physical natural sciences, you're doing say physics and chemistry A levels um, and, and maths, obviously, you probably expect a, a blend of, um, you know, maths, physics and chemistry um, questions. Um, you wouldn't be asked about biology, for, for instance. Um, so, you know, we, we know the A levels that you're taking. We're not going to ask you something that you, you know, haven't covered and have no um, interest in. Uh, so, yeah, be, don't, don't worry too much. Don't be too stressed out about that. Thank you. Um, just going back to the, the online interviews, um, what happens if you've not got a stable internet connection? Is that going to hurt your chances? How do we take that into account? Yeah, so we'll be um, offering, I mean, most colleges, including Corpus, we run a test your tech session and we had uh, our wonderful undergraduate volunteers this year. Um, uh, you, you could book slots with them to test your, your Wi-Fi, make sure everything's working. Um, if your Wi-Fi doesn't work well at home, perhaps you have a family member or your school could offer you um, use of their Wi-Fi. You know, it doesn't have to be in your in your home. It could be um, at a friend's house, but hopefully you can find somewhere that the internet um, is working stably for you. Thank you. Um, does not getting an interview mean you won't get an offer? Or in other words, do we interview everybody that we offer to? Yes, we interview everyone that we offer to. Thank you. Um, what do you think some major interview pitfalls are? Is there any sort of advice on that? Yeah, I think I cover those. Um, uh, a little bit, but um, I guess going going back to that one slide that I showed, um, students not answering the question that was asked. So, um, oh, they've asked me a question I don't know, but I do know the answer to this question I practiced in front of the mirror last night. And so they give that answer, but that just wastes two or three minutes because the interviewer isn't interested in what you know what what you prepared. They want to know the answer to their question. So listening carefully to what's being asked, take time to reflect uh, and give um, precise and concise answers. Um, to, the, to, to the question that's posed to you. That's, that's the main thing I think where students go wrong. Yeah, thank you. And um, next one's actually quite administrative, so I think I'll take it. Somebody's asked, is the interview date uh, flexible or fixed? So um, we give you the opportunity to tell us if there are any set dates that you can't do, that you absolutely know you can't do. Um, so please do tell us that, and then we'll do our best to schedule around that. But interview scheduling is based on interviewer availability as well. So um, we do ask you to be flexible in your interview availability. Um, 
So uh, for an engineering interview, would you be asked about specific engineering disciplines, specifically maybe if you've made it clear in your personal statement an area you're particularly interested in, do you think? Yeah, I mean, engineering at Cambridge is a bit like natural sciences in that for the first couple of years, you try all different disciplines of engineering. So you do a little bit of electrical, a little bit of mechanical, aeronautical, et cetera, um, before you specialize in later years. So um, the interviews for engineering tend to be um, fairly general maths problems, mechanics problems. Um, they might ask you something um, about a mechanic problem related to aeronautical engineering, but they wouldn't expect you to know lots of information about aeronautical engineering. Students aren't at that stage where they specialize yet. Um, go on the I Want to Study Engineering website and have a look at the questions there, and that, that will give you a good sense of what comes up. Thank you. Um, we should take a, a couple more and then we can have a break before the, um, the virtual tour. Um, a few people have asked about admissions tests and whether the admissions tests are used to select for interviews and then also how that's going to work virtually. I know that's kind of spanning out outside of interviews a little bit though. Yeah, that, no, good. Very, very good questions. Um, so uh, you know, all of the pre-interview tests will run, uh, we hope, as normal this year. So things like the BMAT, the NSAA, etc. Um, we do look at these test scores when we're making decisions who to call for interview. Uh, and you know, we're looking for students to demonstrate a certain level of, of proficiency. Um, you know, but again, it's possible to not do you know, amazingly well, uh, but still get um, a, 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 an offer. Some of the interview, or some of the um, rather um, tests are sat at the interview. Uh, and Naomi, maybe you want to say a little bit about how that worked last year, because it will be similar this year. Yeah, so I suspect it will probably be similar this year, as you said, um, to last year. So last year, um, we ran our at interview assessments, actually compute, slightly confusingly, not on the day of interview. They were run uh, a week, sometimes two weeks ahead of your interview, but very close to the interview. So you already knew at that point that you'd been invited for interview and then you'd been invited for this test as well. Um, and it, they were taken via an, an online platform, um, sort of all instructions were sent to applicants and you had a time window basically to download the paper, write your um, assessment and then re-upload it. Um, so it wasn't kind of invigilated in a big exam hall, hall um, in the same way as it might normally be um, sort of when you're taking school tests, but um, you were kind of given the paper, asked to do it in exam conditions and asked to submit it within a certain time. Um, and then I think the, uh, the, the last one we'll take is, um, you did comment on sort of numbers of interviews earlier, I think, but does it mean anything if you get one interview rather than two interviews? Does it vary a little bit? No, so I mean, it varies a little bit on, uh, according to um, interviewer availability and capacity at particular colleges. Um, so for instance, last year um, for philosophy, um, we, we, we only had three interviewers. Um, and so we decided to run one 45 minute interview um, where each of the interviewers took 15 minutes. Um, in you know, natural sciences, we had a more interviewers, so we ran two 25-minute interviews. So in that instance, one candidate was seen for 50 minutes and one candidate was seen for 45. So you know, virtually the, the same um, experience. So it comes down to the practicalities um, at the particular college, but this will all be communicated to you well in advance.